Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cause and Effect, a show about VFS. Uh, today we have a special episode for you, and we are going to talk about tactics, or um, more how you're supposed to plan the points at your table at your advantage to get the game win. Uh, I should warn you, it's probably going to be a little bit about uh, one of our more speculative shows, but bear with us, because hopefully in the end, we have made some uh, progress, and we have uh, hopefully both we and you have learned something at the end of the show. Well, uh, before we go into that, I would like to, as always, introduce my wonderful co-host Adam Espersson. Say hello. Hello. And Isak Espersson Bjarmark. Hello. 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 <laughs> okay. So, um, how has your uh, Vietas week been? Uh, Sorry, lost you there. Yeah, uh, your beat this week. How uh, how has it been? Mine? Uh, it's yeah. been it's been great. Uh, we just had a few games this uh, Monday, but uh, we, I think we managed something like five games in a really short time. Uh, I got to try out a new deck I created that day, and well, it didn't go that well for me. I didn't. I think I had like one table split and no game wins in five games, so no results, but uh, it was <laughs> good at least to try out that deck. It was quite fun experimenting with that deck. Okay. Uh, which deck was it? Uh, I made, uh, like, I think most people have sent send, uh, Nana Baruku, Azure Tablets, Animalism Rush deck. Just making that, but with Potence Weenies instead and Potence Combat. Okay, so how did it feel? Was it as good as the animalism? It needs some card flow management, I think, to uh, make all the combat cards come when you need them, and more importantly, the taste of Ita is really, really important to make the blood go around. So. But possibly, if uh, with more optimization. Okay, cool. And Isaac, how has your week been? It was the same. <coughs> we participated in the same event. Uh, it was great. I think out of the five tables, I think at least two, but maybe even three tables turned out with table splits. I can't really remember what I played and how I did. So it probably means that I didn't do that well. <laughs> I was kind of unfocused. I don't really remember why. Anyways, it was fun. And as Adam said, it was really impressive. Like five games. Uh, five games it was, but it was like something like six or maybe six and a half hours. So, really fast-paced games. Oh, this is great. And you? How are you? Yeah, yeah I've been great. Vietas Messi. Uh, I actually built uh, two decks. Uh, and, uh, of course, I played with you guys, so you know, but uh, I played uh, Lamentation Weenie with Anarch Revolt. So it's super aggressive, which I think is <laughs> going to be really fun. With a little bit tweak, then it's going to be real fun to take to I don't know some uh, uh, mid sides tournament and just tear some ass. <laughs> Rip them a new one. Gotta play yeah. <laughs> in total sixteen rounds or sixteen turns, four turns each. Yeah. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so yes, yes. Uh, okay. awesome. You didn't play in <laughs> Stockholm. Uh, no, uh, I didn't manage to, uh, to, but uh, next Wednesday I will tear some ass with implementation. I'm not going to think. Be warned. <laughs> my god, language, man. Well, language. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. have pictures in my head. <laughs> uh, okay, well, now that the pleasantries are uh, over, we should uh, go on with our episode. Uh, I have dubbed this uh, week's uh, episode to the tactical wheel, wheel, or planning your points. Why we call it the tactical wheel, uh, you will soon find out. But uh, first, let me do a little introduction here, okay? Seating. Uh, it can be both a blessing and a curse, uh, depending on which deck you're playing and uh, which deck you're facing on the table and how well the different decks are doing. Everybody knows the, the math, math behind seating. Well, as, anyway, as everybody knows, well, it's really hard going for the sweep. So you you must like plan your points to be able to to win the game. 
well, and that isn't always that easy, and that's the main point of our show, I believe. So, um, I don't know, Adam, what's the first thing that crosses your mind when you're sitting down at the table? Uh, like, I think the first thing is, will I be able to survive my predator? And will I be able to oust my prey? That okay. should um, be like the... And I mean that in a really general kind of sense as well. Is... Uh, should I, in more than 50% of the cases, be able to survive, say, six rounds with my predator? Or will I be able to oust my prey within six rounds? Uh, I think that's, like, uh, my biggest considerations. Okay, and uh, how... how yeah, is that down that this six round is not an arbitrary number of turns. It is the average of the first oust. So if you want to be on par with the other players on the table, you probably be, need to be that fast. Yeah. So good. Just that. <laughs> exactly. Okay. okay, so uh, how do you make this decision? How do you come to these conclusions? Am I going to be able to survive or not? I think the only thing to know is have the experience with your own deck, mostly your own deck, and how it works against other decks. Uh, the player's quality or the player's playstyle actually matters kind of little when you make this consideration in my experience. Uh, it might be like, okay, I'm playing against a good player, I will be able to oust with six pool uh, rather than I'm playing against a bad player, I will be able to oust with ten pool. Uh, that's how much pool you have left when you're done. But I think the end result will in most cases be the same. You will be able to oust, or you will not be able to oust. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it's mostly the decks that is the focus. Uh, the, this is especially true if you might be facing uh, decks that are on the di different, on the opposite side of the uh, spectra, uh, so to speak, if you follow. So, skill is more, it's more important if two decks that meet have an even matchup. Much more important. Than if the matchup is uneven to begin with. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. And uh, maybe we should elaborate on that. What uh, Isaac means, I think, is that uh, a rush deck will eventually be able to oust most decks without combat defense. It doesn't yeah. matter how good your player you are, because without combat defense, you'll just rush these guys into torpor. Uh, okay. Yeah. If you want to, like, um, the bottom line. So it's like, uh, is this the first thing that crosses your mind as well? Do you have anything more to add? Uh, those are true, but I'm trying to get a sense of what the different players are playing. This might be sort of the same thing as Adam said, but uh, I'd really try to figure out what are they playing. Uh, and if I know what, what they're playing, can I start uh, ma making guesstimates on how their starting hand looks like. Mm -hmm. okay. So how do you find out what other people are playing? Uh, there are several different options. and you One is experience, like if you have experience with a certain player, you know his or her play style and choices of decks and how they tend to build decks and what decks they tend to play. So that is one part, the experience part. The other part is the actual cards that you see, i.e. discarded cards or cards in play. Uh, but the other options are counting crypt, or the 12 cards, or the 13 cards, or the 28 cards in the crypt, counting library cards, 90 cards, 60 cards, 75 cards. Uh, and I think that's about the first action is very defining usually also. And first so uh, first minion as well, of course. Yeah, the first minion, very ov obviously. The first minion, the the first couple of action that minion takes. But you, you can also like just bluntly ask people what you play. <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah, that works. So, so, uh, but yeah. something that's interesting is also that uh, normally uh, the first time that you have to make a choice 
which like an actual choice is when you have your first minion or when you have your first master phase action with the minion uh, by that I most okay. often mean how much you want the villain lane for is a big choice and what will your first action be is a big choice at this point your prey and predator will most of the time have discarded a few cards or played a few cards and has at least one minion up themselves so uh, since that's the first uh, choices you make, that's also the uh, first information, the most uh, interesting and crucial information is uh, the first minion and the first few cards in their ash heap. Yeah. And it's mostly just uh, like mix and match of, uh, okay, this vampire has these disciplines, uh, these cards are in the library, which could be uh, the sidekicks, or the friends, or the additional vampires, and which could be the additional cards. So say, if you see someone discard a govern conditioning, or a govern, or a conditioning, you will most likely uh, uh, say that that person also plays deflection. Even though you haven't seen a deflection, that's a, more or less a given. And you do the same with a lot of things. Uh, say, yeah. if someone discards a prevent card, fortune prevent card, you might think that that player has free drives. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, how how much length do you tend to go to to obfuscate what you what you yourself are playing? Exactly. Uh, in the actual game, uh, like socially, or socially wise, uh, very much. I'm not disclosing any information unless I actually do need to disclose it. For instance, if I've scouted that another player on the table played the same crypt as me, I try to disclose it straight away, and the sort of discussing. Are you playing that vampire? Am I playing that vampire? Because you can't afford a, a contest that early on. So that's... Otherwise, I just keep my mouth shut and don't try to tell anyone anything. But I don't hesitate to discard. Or hesitate okay. to play liquidation, for instance. <laughs> okay, why don't you hesitate to discard, like, um, intercept cards, or obviously cards can be a real telltale sign on what you're playing? Like, in, I'd, maybe this is an exaggeration, but I think, like, in 99 cases out of 100, it doesn't change what the other players does. So, there is an obfuscate card in your ash heap, or there isn't. They're going to bring up their designated first vampire anyways, and are going to do the first couple of actions are the same, no matter what. Most cases. There are, uh, of course, exceptions to this. But that is, at least that's my attitude. I benefit more from discarding than not to discard. So also also consideration the of, uh, uh, especially if you're playing... Uh, like uh, a lot versus other players, you will know how it feels like to be facing people who know what you're playing. If you're playing your deck for the tenth time against the same group you've been playing against for six years, uh, this deck uh, is, is no mystery for anyone, and, but you still have a chance to win. So yeah. a deck does not hinge on it being kept secret. Uh, it might be an advantage in a lot of cases, so keeping it secret if you can is, of course, should be an, uh, a priority. But uh, you should uh, still it sh the deck should be able to function still even if the other players know what you're playing. So you might give yourself an advantage against players who can't figure out what you're playing. So if you're playing against bad players, you will gain an advantage against the bad players. But if you're playing against Either someone who has uh, knowledge from beforehand what you're playing, or playing against a good player who has the deductive or reasoning skills to figure out what you're playing, this advantage does not exist. And it's these players that you need to watch out for anyway. It's these players that you need that extra edge. You can't waste the discard phase action and then try to win against a player that's really, really good, because that will come back to bite you later on. Yeah. I think that's very okay. true. But, but another important thing is to, in this, this deducting thing is to do your research, do your homework. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are medium experienced or unexperienced, or even if you're experienced. For, for me, it's a natural part of life. I go to the Las Sombras tournament in Deck Archive and check out new entries all the time. I check them out, check the deck list, check the crypts, and try to figure out how they work. 
and you could go to the Extrala blog and check his uh, deck archetype uh, archive out to get a, a grasp on how certain archetypes. And when you do this, you start to get uh, see a pattern on how do the groups look. So if you see one vampi vampire, you have a, a, a huge advantage uh, compared to if you hadn't done the research to figure out which are the other eleven vampires. Okay. And especially if you start to figure that out together with uh, uh, the airship. So, mm, but when you're sitting down at a table at a tournament and uh, you don't really know what other people are playing, how, how much is it worth to sacrifice to gain that kind of knowledge? Is it worth taking a bleed that would be blocked to see if a uh, opponent has combat or how nope. Nope. it depends on how it plays? Extremely rarely, I'd say. Uh, I, I very no, I I don't think so. Especially the combat example that you bring up here, I think almost never. As if you are playing the non-combat deck, no, then it's not an option, I don't think. But if you're playing combat yourself, and uh, you have a minion that's relatively expendable, say a two cap or a one cap, uh, just seeing how the other player wants to do their combat will help you prepare yourself. So the most uh, easiest example of this is long range or close range. If you're a close range yeah. deck, you will want to know if your prey or your predator or whoever is likely to do, do damage to you at long range or called short range. Uh, okay. So if you're playing combat deck yourself, I think that's actually uh, could be viable information. Not always, because losing yeah. a two cap is still losing a two cap. It's a resource that you want to keep. But uh, in some cases, it could be useful, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we were going... Uh, you mentioned combat long range and short range. There's always, uh, uh, there's always something to trump what you're playing, and that's one of the magic things about Vietas, I believe. Uh, but that's also one of the hardest things about Vietas. So uh, we have actually made a little um, tactical wheel explaining this and how you're supposed to think when you're meeting um, Dexter Trump your own. Uh, Adam, why don't you uh, bring us in or uh, explain what the tactical wheel is and how you came to think of it. Uh, yeah, it actually came to me through another hobby of mine, uh, which is watching StarCraft games. And they talked about this term, which I found really, really useful. And it's uh, evidently it comes from uh, fencing. Uh, I'll bring up a picture of uh, something that I just found on Google. Let's see here. Yeah. So this is a tactical wheel. That it comes from fencing, the term. Uh, uh, and it starts off with uh, one option to make a simple attack, it's called, in uh, fencing. To be able to best someone who's doing a simple attack against you, you want to do a parry and repost. If someone does parry and repost against you, you want to do the next thing in the tactical wheel, and so on yeah. and so forth. And then eventually it you know, makes full circle with the simple attack uh, being an advantageous move again. Uh, this is the same logic as how you win rock, paper, scissors. Uh, yeah. So, And I found this term to be really, really useful uh, for analyzing betas as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, how? <laughs> <laughs> yes, how? Isaac, do you want to go forward? Yeah, uh, so how, I think there are a no number of ways to analyze these beaters, but one thing is to make a huge wheel, uh, and possibly not even a wheel, but anyways, think of it as a wheel, and then put every existing tournament viable deck uh, or archetype that exists that are tournament viable and put them in this wheel and you will see this so if I play X then I get defeated by Y and if I play Y I get defeated by Z and so on and so forth and eventually the theory <laughs> at least the, uh, is that you reach full circle and the most typical examples being the uh, <laughs> the trinity of Auspex Weenie uh, that beats uh, a bleed deck, a bleed deck beats a rush deck, and a rush deck bleed beats a auspex winning deck. Those three 
works as a wheel. And you can start off from there and start making your own circle or mind map. Anyways, okay. they, that's <laughs> how, how we have interpreted the tactical wheel to this episode. Yeah, uh, this, of course, uh, translates very easily to the five player table when you're playing Vietas and uh, how you're supposed to play to gain enough points to win the game. Uh, so, Adam, uh, why don't you bring us in on the <laughs> what we're trying to do here. It's a little bit fussy right now, but we're going to make it a little bit more concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we made a, um, an example of how a five player game might look with uh, a few decks. Uh, it's a five-player table. The orange triangle is our subject, and then you have the prey, the ground prey, the ground predator, and the uh, predator. Uh, in this, okay. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, go ahead. So, for you who usually listen to us, this is a good time to just glance at the screen uh, on <laughs> on the different decks. Uh, so basically, this is when you figure out what the other players are playing. So this is usually by turn two, possibly turn three, depending on your deduction skills and or how uh, reluctant each individual player is to uh, show uh, what they're playing. Okay. And this is just a sample configuration of how a table could look. Uh, and I think we'll be talking a bit about how this how you might reason about this table, right? Yes. Yeah. So, but basically, um, the thing is, you're supposed to be able to put your deck in this matrix and then scramble other decks and then like try to figure out how how you should how you can win the table and take as many points as you can against different decks, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or rather, yeah. how you get the game win should be the. Yeah important consideration. So should we start off with this? We're, we're the player playing the Animalism Rush deck. That's hunting uh, Auspex Sweeney, that's hunting a lower firm, hunting a Kaisid Stealth Blade, hunting a Inner Circle, hunting us, the Animalist Rush deck. Yeah. So, uh, we, we started talking a bit before the show about this, and you, uh, Adam, said that you were supposed to do nothing. Yeah. Uh, I don't totally agree, but could you mm -hmm. tell us why? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, when I, as I said, the first thing, the most important or the first consideration is, can I survive past round six? Can I out by round six? And in this configuration, I would say, yes, you can. The inner circle vote might carry one or two majesties, but probably not too many. You will be able to rush the first guy, and after that, it's just downhill for that, um, that player. The Auspice Weenie, yeah. you're your direct counter to an Auspice Weenie. Rushing can't be bounced. You kill that player outright. There's nothing that player can do. Yeah. But you might, you might face a few magnums, but nothing that's going to last in the long run. No, no. It'll do two damage to you, and it'll do three damage to him, and you'll play Taste of Eta. Yeah. Uh, but then you need to also consider the Grand Prey and the Grand Predator. And now it becomes a bit more tricky, because... Uh, the Grand Prey is a law. F oh, sorry, I'll use the mouse. The Grand Prey is a law firm, and uh, law firms uses lots of majesty normally, and also can do a lot of damage with one stealth. Uh, so you can't block it. So this is a really, really bad deck uh, for an animalism rush, in my opinion. And the same goes with the Kiosk. Yeah, it can do a lot of damage. Yeah, with just one or two minions. Mm -hmm. so. And it has might have uh, nocturnes as well, and then it's even more annoying to kill that player. So if you back rush your uh, predator to survive, and then you rush your prey to kill him, you'll be in a three-player situation where the Chaosid can build as much as he like because he's not stressed for anything. Uh, the Inner Circle deck will die eventually. Uh, and then he can just build and he can oust you. Or, and the law firm player can stack his hand on whatever he needs to back oust you as soon as he needs to. C can I halt you for just one moment? Mm -hmm. So you're proposing that the inner circle and the auspex we have gone. We rushed like crazy backwards and forwards. 
backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it looks like this. So the almost between in the inner circle are also by this point because of the uh, infamous crater created by the rush deck. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have yeah, uh, and then you have the option of either you rush your uh, predator, uh, the Chiosid stealthy deck, uh, which might and might or might not work, but you will probably have a, a, a very low amount of pool when you're done anyway. Uh, and then the law firm deck can just play one or two Magises and then you're dead. So in this, if you get one victory point and, and back out two players, you'll probably lose the duel against the law firm. And if you rush forwards, you might or might not even kill him and you will die to the Chaos itself speed. So this three-player configuration you don't want to end up in with as an, as an animation rush deck. Okay. okay. Uh, so what do you want to happen then? Um, so you, this is what probably is going to happen if we end up rushing both those with Winnie and the Inner Circle both deck. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you leave the Auspex Winnie alive, I would argue that it's quite risk-free to leave the Auspex Winnie alive. Uh, at least uh, you might not want to let him get seven minions, but if you don't oust him, he will eventually kill the law firm. Because the law firm, uh, well, he'll die to that, probably. The bleeds will be bounced by the Chaos deck, and the votes will be blocked by the Auspex Winnie. Uh, and then after that, you might be able to kill the Auspex Winnie. Uh, the inner circle vote deck, you probably don't want to back out because, uh, well, you want to rush the first minion because you don't want to take damage. But after that, he will probably die to the Chaos itself bleed because the law firm uh, can't vote and he will be able to bounce a few bleeds. Uh, so the inner circle vote deck will die with or without your rushes. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's very probable because. Uh, the setup of a, a, a Kaisen Stealthy deck is, is really fast. And it takes a few turns, and they can, uh, in extreme cases, have their oust by turn four. But in all likelihood, turn five. Mm -hmm. In a circle, both decks have a really hard time with the Kaisen Stealthy beat in the back. They have to rely heavily on going backwards, say, uh, banishments, uh, stuff like that or the occasional mind rape if they have a pack a few of them but basically mind rapes and uh, when you're in this situation uh, since you don't haven't had had rush a lot you just need to rush the inner circle vote deck a few times and also between a few times possibly if you want to you don't even need to you will be able to one get a lot of minions and stack your hand so you can defend yourself against the Chaosid in the best possible way. Even if it has defense, uh, you will be able to torporize a few guys and have a lot of pool to survive his bleeds. Uh, so you'll be able to rush his guys to torpor and survive him, and then probably kill the Auspex Weenie before the Auspex Weenie has done enough pool damage to the Chaosid stealth bleed, because the Auspex Weenie does not kill that fast. Especially in not a uh, vampire, uh, Methuselah only does the D actions against his prey. So, so okay. you're proposing basically that uh, you could more or less back out the inner circle deck, but you can rely a lot, lot on this case in stealth speed deck. You don't have to overrush him, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and because after you're done with that, you stay alive against the case in stealth because it's stealth speed, uh, but you kill your auspice weenie prey uh, as soon as you can. And then you're in the heads up in this situation where you have already rushed a few of the Chaos Dex minions. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's uh, that's that's how you play <laughs> plan out the the game as an animalist rush deck to win it. Yeah. Basically you should yeah, yeah basically you should uh, th think of a number of scenarios in your head. What happens if I do X and try to make a scenario? That is what you use the first two or three turns for in the game, where you don't need to think about so many other things. And then you make a few scenarios. Scenario X, scenario Z, scenario Y, etc., etc. And try to figure out 
what happens if I lean backwards, what happens if I lean forwards, what happens if I play a very passive game, yeah. etc. If you continue to elaborate in your mind. So, and this is all considering there's no deals being done if everybody just playing their game. Yeah. Because as soon as deals start to f afloat, uh, you're playing whole a whole other game. Yeah, in this yes. table, for instance, it's very likely that the inner circle vote deck will want to deal with someone. Because yeah. it's really, really low chances of staying alive. Probably with the, um, the law firm will probably want to deal, right? Taking out I, the I, I think the inner, inner circle deck uh, maybe want to cut a deal with the Wolfpack Sweeney. Uh, that's theoretical. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a little bit too too much to get into right now. Um, Agreed. Yeah, we will try to explain this a little bit more in part two, and also how you are supposed to um, take this out in reality and do something with it. Uh, how to back house, how to pick your uh, seat at the final table, and how to make this uh, make meta game choice using this model. Uh, but that's in part two, and uh, we will see you then. See you.